Corticoina is rare, but it can have life-changing consequences for patients if not acted upon in a timely manner. Even though I'd been told what symptoms to look out for, you don't expect from having a bad back, even if it's two slip discs, um, to you know having the possibility of it being a permanent situation. You don't expect. You always expect when you've got a bad back to um, to get better. The cord equina provides innovation to the lower limbs and the sphincter. It controls the function of the bladder and bowel and sensation to the skin around the back passage and the bottom. The most common cause of cord equina syndrome is a prolapsed disc of the lumbar spine, but other conditions such as spinal stenosis, metastatic spinal cord compression can also cause cord equina syndrome. There is no agreed definition of cord equina syndrome, but the British Association of Spinal Surgeons present a definition that's clinically useful. A patient presenting with acute back pain and or leg pain with a suggestion of a disturbance of their bladder and bowel and or saddle sensory disturbance should be suspected as having cord equina syndrome. We know that most of these patients will not have a critical cord equina compression, but in the absence of reliable predictive signs and symptoms, we should scan these patients urgently. To give advice to anybody, I think they've got to be as genuine and as forthcoming as possible. So if, if somebody asks you a question that you think you might be embarrassed about, I don't think embarrassment comes into it. Physiotherapists have taken on more and more extended scope roles. As part of that, we've taken on increased accountability and responsibility for our patients. We have a duty of care to our patients to manage them safely and effectively. There are increasing numbers of negligence claims going through related to cord requina syndrome uh, and these are increasingly involving physiotherapists. What's really important though is that this is about the patient. So these uh, cord requina claims are not just compensation claims, these claims have devastating effects on people's lives. So I have to say it was a privilege to lead this qualitative study investigating patients' experience of developing cord requina syndrome to understand their story and these powerful experiences these patients have had. You don't expect to end up in a wheelchair. You don't expect to end up um, with your bladder and your bowel not working. You don't expect to end up um, numb and you don't expect to end up in um, permanent pain. The problem was the effects I'd had prior to the surgery, I was expecting those to be rectified through having the surgery. I wasn't aware that the damage that had been caused because it hadn't been caught soon enough um, was going to be either semi-permanent or, as I know now, permanent. A key theme was that communication is so important. In the context of severe pain, these patients didn't often recognise subtle and vague symptoms such as saddle numbness or early bladder symptoms. In the context of severe pain, equally, it was very difficult to concentrate on the questions that they were being asked. The questions didn't have any face value. What has my bladder function got to do with my severe back pain? I was asked by the GPs, you know, whether there was anything wrong with my bladder. Um, I, didn't, I didn't know why they were asking these questions, but they did ask. Similar symptoms, all describing pain, leg pain, and bladder and bowel symptoms, maybe saddle anaesthesia, and not all of those are necessary for a diagnosis of cord equina syndrome. But they came on in different orders and this is also important to recognise. They'd all experience back pain at some point in their life. They recognised that this was different. None of them recognised how serious this was. The outcomes could be poor, in fact life-changing, and that medical advice needed to be sought immediately. Nobody ever tells you it's going to be permanent, ever. All patients were keen that we helped further clinicians to identify these patients early that nobody suffered unduly. It was interesting to hear what they came up with. They wanted something like a cue card in their consultation, something that would frame the questions as being important, something that would help the clinician to understand that this is going to be a very important part of the consultation. The patient needed to understand these questions are so important for us to understand. I had to Google cord equina when um, I saw my notes following my surgery 
has um, Cordoquine syndrome on it. You can imagine the shock when you see, when you Google it. Um, you <laughs> it's, yeah, it's not the greatest experience. They wanted a card, a card with the questions that mapped against the cue card. They wanted this card to take away with them. They might not have had symptoms in the consultation, but if they developed later, they wanted to remember what those things were and essentially what to do should they develop. If they did seek urgent help, they wanted to take this card with them so that it would help them to communicate these sometimes embarrassing but serious symptoms. In terms of who should we safety net? Well, we don't want to safety net every single patient because we'll end up scaring patients who don't need to be concerned. So you should safety net patients who you think may progress to developing cord requirement syndrome. If I'd gone to the GP and he'd given me a card or a leaflet with a cord requirement, I could have been uh, probably at A&E at the weekend rather than waiting till the Wednesday. So it would have been two, maybe three days prior that I could have been in which obviously I know now could have helped with my rehabilitation and the nerve damage that was caused from the, the cord equina. If cord equina syndrome is suspected, a careful objective neurological examination should be carried out to evaluate dermatomal sensory loss, myotome weakness and reflex change. Sensation of the perineum and digital rectal examination should also be performed by an appropriately trained clinician. So if we had to summarise, what would be our three take-home messages from today? So for me, communication would be the important thing. It's important that we frame the important questions we're asking the patient, that we use patient language so they understand exactly what they're being asked and we're getting answers to the questions that we've asked and that the patient understands exactly what the consequences are of this condition. Mm, okay, and for me it's about safety netting, so it's about giving the patient a card or some kind of literature so they know exactly what to do if they get some of those symptoms. And for me it would be about standards of practice and standards of care, so I think there are two aspects to that. First as aspect would be the documentation, so there's a clear record of the, the patient's journey through the service. Uh, and the other thing, uh, again going, you know, linking in with the standards of care, would be to make sure that people maintain their competencies. Please listen to your patients listen to what they're telling you and put, every, put the puzzle together. Yeah, I think it's working with patients as partners. We can make a real difference to getting these cordyquina sufferers to the surgical team in a timely manner. <laughs>